Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for joining uh, to listen to Robert go through some SXL. My name is Paul Marini. I'm one of the sales guys at Avid. I want to also thank uh, the music people for hosting Robert and I um, and opening up this panel. If you guys have questions, there's two ways to do it. You can put it in the chat um, and you know, I'll answer it or one of the texts that TMP will answer your questions. Or if you want to say something to Robert directly, just put it in the chat window to everybody and I'll be happy to interrupt Robert and help you answer that question. Also, I'd like to mention uh, that TMP is running uh, some financing specials. If you're qualified and you're looking to get a desk, um, they can do uh, multi-pay terms up to 150 days. So something that you might want to talk to your TMP uh, sales rep about. Let me bounce this over to the man of the hour, Mr. Scoville. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks a ton, Paul. Appreciate that, man. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for taking care of all the details that I forget to say every one of the webinars. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this little webinar we're going to put on this morning in uh, conjunction with TMP. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, you know, we I think we uh, all kind of sat around and thought, you know, what would be great for to do for everybody, and probably ourselves included, uh, was to get to put together a webinar, uh, really, that just kind of showcases all of the stuff that, that SXL has become over four or five years now. Uh, you know, we, we had a huge software release, honestly, the biggest software release in the history of the company. Uh, with Venue 7, you know, not long before the pandemic uh, shut us down. Uh, so, you know, as I talk to users and everybody, you know, throughout the week and stuff, uh, I'm, I'm constantly kind of amazed at how, how many times I run across the situation where somebody will say, boy, I wish we had Sixcel did that. And you say, it already does that. So we're going to try uh, to quell some of those uh, things going on and uh, get you up to speed on what's happening with Sixcel. So this is going to be a a big high level overview. It will be like drinking from a fire hose a little bit, but I think you guys will get a good, a good run through here. And of course, if you have questions, please ask it and uh, I'll try to get them answered. Uh, we'll try to put together a few little demonstrations here for you as well, if we can swing it, if the, if the time allows. All right, so let's get it going here. So um, as you guys, uh, maybe some of you have read it. I, I just recently wrote an article for ProSound News uh, outlining the history of the uh, unified platform and what that means. And, uh, you know, this is a very new thing, uh, even though we've been doing it for a little while with SXL, you know, it was our plan from the get-go with SXL. But it's kind of new to the industry and it's kind of a new concept to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, just to kind of give you the idea of what it is, it is a platform of products, right? Meaning we have a set of control surfaces, a set of engines and a set of I.O., and they all work together and they all work on one piece of software, right? So it, it does provide for true a la carte system design. You can scale your system up in terms of control and down in terms of processing power, almost to uh, almost unlimited, uh, you know, in terms of scalability. So you can do some really, really great things with this. And, you know, the cool thing about it is you can change the scale of your system at any time, right? So. Uh, if you, uh, the best example I think of that are using, are, are talking for churches, you know, where you might throughout the most, most of the part of your year, you have one system need, one system size, one system scale need. But for those big events like Christmas and Easter and, you know, others, you actually need a bigger, maybe you need a bigger control surface. Maybe you need a more powerful engine. Well, really it's as simple as going down to the vendor and saying, hey, I need to rent an engine or I need to rent a bigger control surface for the weekend or for the week or for rehearsals plug it in and go to work. You know, there's no, no fuss, no muss with it. It just, it, it scales up seamlessly. So the concept of unified platform is pretty enticing and it's, uh, it's served us certainly very well. And I think it's served the vendors very, very well as well. All right, so let's start out. Uh, we're just gonna do a, a really quick flyover of all the hardware available and some of the interconnection highlights that we got uh, capable on our systems. Okay, so let's start here. As I mentioned, we have five control surfaces currently available for SXL, ranging from 48 faders down to 16 faders. Uh, the top series of those consoles that you see up there are what we call the D series, and the D kind of stands for displays. If you notice, they all have a series of touch displays right above the knob modules, right? 
whereas the C for compact and uh, uh, down on the bottom row there, those do not have those touch displays, but they all operate exactly the same. And they, they will all address any show file that you throw at them. Matter of fact, you could hot, I don't wanna say hot swap, but you could un, uh, unpatch one control surface and patch in the other, reboot your show file, and it will automatically scale it uh, to the surface that it's connected to. Uh, each one of these surface, or, I'm sorry, we're gonna go to the engines next. So we also offer three engine uh, choices here currently, E6L, 112, 144, and 192. And the, uh, the suffix on this, the 112, 144, and 192 uh, speaks to input processing channels. That's how many input processing channels you have available to these engines. Now they all scale a little bit in terms of their scalability, uh, in terms of how much additional processing power you can add to them in terms of HDX cards or expansion cards, et cetera. But that 112, 144, 192 always addresses the number of input processing channels. It does, does not address output processing in any way, shape, or form. All of those uh, output channels are, are there regardless of that number, right? So uh, some of these will scale down in terms of the amount of auxes that you have available to you, uh, things like that. Uh, but all of them uh, are based on that 192, 144, 112 input processing channel. That's kind of to get a read on what, what size system you're going to have. In terms of I.O., uh, we have three shareable I.O. devices currently available for SXL. It's a Stage 64, Stage 32, and Stage 16. Uh, currently in, our, uh, in the venue software, you can have up to six devices uh, on a stage on a shared AVB ring. Uh, maximum of 192 inputs, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, each, end, each device indicates the number of inputs possible. Again, so 64 inputs possible, 32 inputs possible, uh, and 16 inputs possible. Uh, we have a 16-channel Dante card that is available for these stage racks as well. You can you could build an entire Dante stage rack if you needed to do that uh, with a lot of Dante input and output capability on it. Uh, MADI splits are already built into these racks with the exception of stage 16. Uh, so you have a MADI split that, it is, that comes standard on stage 32 and stage 16, and it does have sample rate conversion on it as well. So if you needed to split out to a, a console that's running a different sample rate, you can do that right on the stage rack itself. Just adjust the SRC and off you go. Uh, back to the control surface, uh, these are the local I.O. available for the control surfaces. As you can see, the smallest control surface there, 16C, uh, because of real estate, uh, as much as anything, has a very limited amount of actual physical I.O. Uh, so we allow you to actually expand the I.O. with a device that we call uh, Local 16. So you, get, uh, you could get up to 16 inputs, 16 outputs, both digital and analog. Uh, by attaching two of these devices on the local ring for the console. Uh, for the, all of the other consoles, they already essentially have a local 16 built into them, uh, but you can add a second if you want to expand that I.O. Uh, at the console itself. In terms of expansions and option cards, uh, you know, we offer the HDX uh, uh, DSP card, which is used in Pro Tools. This is a, a different flashed version of it. Uh, that is just, uh, programmed to do plugins only, uh, but you can you use those as your plugin processors within the engine. Uh, you can have up to four cards, and uh, it's worth mentioning that all engines, regardless of size, now come with 400 plugin slots available to them. And of course, that's above and beyond the normal input EQ, gate, dynamics, etc., that is on every input and output. Uh, so it's an enormous amount of processing capability at the uh, with our engines. Uh, we have a MADI card available, a MADI expansion card that can go in the engine. Uh, each card is 64 channels of bi-directional 96 kilohertz audio. Uh, and you, again, you can have up to four cards in the engine to account for 192 inputs. Uh, we also make a Waves card. This is a pretty exciting uh, deal uh, where we added a third-party product to the platform. So we have a Waves card that goes in the engine, and it's just a simple Cat5 out to one of their servers uh, either, you could even do two of their servers, as you'll see here, for redundancy, but just simple Cat5, no additional I.O. boxes, anything like that. All the software is run within the, uh, within the console. It all stores with show file, et cetera, even less show files uh, from previous versions of Venue, Profile, DShow, all of those, load them on 
S6L and it will account for all your Waves plugins in the show file. Uh, really, really advanced, really beautifully integrated workflow. Uh, we also recently released a, an AVB Milan card uh, that can go in the engine. This is uh, AVB Milan is a audio specific uh, AVB version uh, that a lot of uh, PA manufacturers are adopting for audio transport, uh, transport back and forth to PA systems, et cetera. But it also accounts for a huge 128 by 128 network uh, that you can just establish outside of the shared and the local AVB ring on the systems. So you could use this for PA drive, you could use it for communications, uh, for playback sends, all kinds of things on this uh, simple, simple network card that goes in the engine. So very powerful set of options there for you. Let's see what we got next. Yeah, and of course, you know, we are Avid. Uh, we do Pro Tools as well as Venue. Uh, and in kind of doing such, we have really the most integrated, uh, you know, concept between a, a live sound console and a Pro Tools recording system. Uh, matter of fact, you can easily do redundancy here with, with two systems just with a simple Cat5 uh, to the control surface and you have up to 128 tracks of playback and record redundant uh, if you want it to be. Uh, you can add other recorders, like if we're in our shared systems, you can add other recorders on other systems as well. Uh, all handles it just fine. It's really great. Also have uh, the venue link concept, if you're not familiar with that. Once you have these systems attached to your console, if you build your patch, label your show file, everything like you're going to do, just build your Pro Tools session from venue. That's going to be a choice as you open up your Pro Tools session where you can build it from venue. It will automatically build the tracks automatically label them, automatically patch them, save you an hour's worth of work on a big show and, and get done in about two minutes. So it's, it's a really, really handy feature. Uh, here is more on the Waves uh, integration to Venue. As I mentioned, it's a card that goes inside the engine. Uh, you can have up to two servers attached to that card uh, for redundancy. And here's one of the really nice little bonuses of doing it this way in our system is that uh, you only have to buy one set of licenses. You can run one set of licenses on each server if you're doing it redundant. And, uh, you know, on competitor systems, et cetera, if you're going to do redundant waves servers, guess what? You're going to need two licenses as well, as well as some significant I.O. and control of that, uh, of that server. So this is really a wonderful uh, integration to Venue. I was really excited to see this come online. Uh, we recently qualified using Luminex AVB switches. Uh, so we have full qualification and support for these systems. This is for doing star point connection of your system so we can get off of redundant ring. Uh, this allows us uh, to, to do some really, really great things in terms of connection. Is that Paul? Is he going to interrupt me there? Paul is good at interrupting me. I'm just waiting. I'm kind of counting my, I'm kind of counting down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at Starpoint here. So in the Starpoint system, uh, we have our normal local ring that goes to the 32D or whatever console that you want to have it there. And then we go simple Cat5 connection to the switch and then just attach the stage devices to the switch as well. And that's a, that's a single uh, Starpoint connection. Uh, we could, as I said, we can do uh, uh, six devices on a, uh, a Starpoint connection uh, so uh, works out great here. And if you want to do that redundantly, you just add a second switch and attach it to the B ports of the engine and the B ports of all the uh, I.O. devices and you are off to the races. Uh, I, I've used this out in the field quite a few times now. It just absolutely works. Fantastic. I haven't had it. Robert, single, I might be jumping time. ahead a little bit here. Um, can you connect uh, more than two consoles when you use a star network? You are, in fact, jumping ahead, Paul, and I'm going to solve that problem right here. <laughs> so, yes, you can connect. Uh, oh, wow, my graphics messed up there. That graphic didn't come across. Okay, so thank you for asking that question, Paul. Let me see if I, oh, here it is. It's all coming in. Sorry, I, I didn't realize I had it automated here. So yes, the beauty of the Starpoint connection is that it, it allows us to do more than two consoles in gain sharing or input sharing and gain tracking now. So as you can see here, we have you know three different size consoles, different size engines, all sharing a common 
uh, set of stage racks here. Okay, so this would is really not possible. I, I mean, in in the strictest of sense, it's possible in uh, redundant ring, but it's so complex and so fraught with danger to do it. You, I really just recommend anybody that's going to do multiple console sharing, meaning three uh, or more, then you want to get to star point here. It just makes the whole thing much easier to put together and much easier to troubleshoot. So, uh, but this handles it just flawlessly, really, really good. So again, as you see here, all the A ports of the engine systems go to the A uh, or your primary uh, switch. All the B ports go to the secondary switch and you are off to the races, right? Let's see what else, I, what other goodies I've got in here. Oh, here we go, yes, sorry. So in this situation, this is actually, uh, and this is something we've seen go into a number of facilities now, where they'll use Pro Tools and Venue to record and broadcast. So that third console that's on the right there, maybe they'll use that in their broadcast facility or whatever and do their live on-air mixes with that, and then come back and remix for post by just attaching an S6 system to that Pro Tools system and actually have full runtime automation, be able to mix in, in their control room, et cetera. So they just have a, a fourth control service online that is strictly a tactile interface for that third Pro Tools system that is recording and also broadcasting to on air. Uh, this is really easily done. This is, it, there's really no fuss, no much to do this with our systems. They're so beautifully integrated here. Did that answer your question, Paul? Yes, thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right, so all right, so let's kind of go through some uh, software and some operational highlights here. So as you guys all know, we, we are really one of the only companies that runs third-party plugins uh, on our systems where we allow you know, other people to uh, program processing and we run it on our uh, DSP cards, no different than we do in Pro Tools, et cetera. These are the companies that we have uh, qualified their plugins and uh, you know, allow uh, use of them on the console. I, I will take the time to say this, uh, even though it's, it feels odd to say it at times, but I want to say this to everybody. If you're trying to use plugins on S6L that are not within this group of manufacturers, I really, really caution you not to do that uh, because they, we have not tested them. Those companies have not tested them on S6L. Uh, and you honestly, you're putting your show at risk when you do that. So uh, uh, we have a, an incredible breadth of plugins to be able to use on this system, and I would encourage you to please try to stick within the bounds of what we have qualified and what we have tested. Okay, so that's your public service announcement for the day. So here's uh, a look at some of the Waves plugins running on S6L. As you can see, it runs right in our uh, in our plugin window, and then you have the uh, ability to uh, put additional Waves plugins in series on that channel. So uh, you know, not only do you have one plugin slot accounted for the waves, but then you have another, you know, three, six uh, plugins. Uh, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plugins available on the uh, on the waves channel itself. So again, really, probably more processing than you're ever going to need. That is for sure. Uh, we're also supporting via plugin uh, immersive control. So if you guys have been following immersive audio for live sound, you know that uh, MB Audio Technic, uh, uh, Audio Technic, uh, L Acoustics with Elisa, uh, Flux, uh, they're doing Spat Revolution, etc. All of those processors can be remote controlled by venue at the channel level. You can just simply pull up the Elisa or the DNB or the Flux plugin on the channel and actually operate the object within their DSP at the console. We we are in work uh, currently working with other companies that are doing uh, spatialization as well, and I'm sure their plugins will come online here before long as well. But this is a pretty exciting time in live sound. There's a lot going on uh, with with this new format of immersive, and I'm pretty excited to do it. I, I'm pretty excited how S6L is going to be able to deal with it. It's it's going to be really really good. Uh, if you didn't know it, uh, this is really kind of one of those unsung hero software updates uh, that people just go, man, why didn't you do that 10 years ago? And, uh, you know, I don't have an answer why we didn't do it 10 years ago, but I know we have it now. So you have, on, when you load up a Venue 7 uh, system, uh, you have a help tab now uh, under the options tab. And 
if you go down through all of these tabs, these are all different help uh, guides to get you through a problem. If you're, if you're wondering how to do something, et cetera, it's all right here on the console. Uh, and you also have, oops, I didn't show it here, but you also have QR codes in that very last tab down there where you can literally take your phone up on the screen and grab a QR code and it will take you to a video, uh, take you to more information online, et cetera. So you can really, really dig down. All of that is on the console now. Don't have to go to the website necessarily to find it. You can, uh, especially if you don't have an internet connection on the day, you can actually get to all that information uh, on the console. Uh, here's a nice feature that we've added uh, in Venue 7. There are uh, graphic EQs, high-pass filters, and low-pass filters on every single output on the console. Every auxiliary, every group, every main bus, left, right, center, every matrix. All of them have that capability now. Uh, so it's just an expansion of processing and expansion of power uh, in the engines. But it's very, very handy uh, for a lot of different workflows. We also have a parallel mix control on, the, on every channel now. Every channel meaning every input and every output uh, has the ability to parallel compress right on the channel, parallel gate or expand right on the channel, and also do parallel EQ, believe it or not. And parallel EQ is kind of a mystery to some folks. Really what it turns out to be is just a scaler, right? Maybe I could show you that here. Let's, uh, let me get to... Let me get back to a different window here. Right here. Let's go here. So this is the S6L I got sitting in front of me here. Let's go here. And let me go to my outputs. So this works really good for output equalization, I think. I, I mean, it works great everywhere, uh, but if you were to say build an EQ that looked something like this, maybe this was your system EQ for the day, right? Something like that. Well, you have the ability to scale it. So let's say you did this in your system EQ. The room was empty. The the filters feel a little, uh, you know, a little, little big. Maybe you just think, you know, really, I just want to take some of that EQ down in terms of its scale. So if I just change the scale of it, I'm just now I'm at even at 50%, it's just reduced all of the filters by 50%, right? So it's a really, really handy feature just to kind of check yourself and be able to scale an equalization. And like I say, I think it works. It's most suited for doing it on for system style equalization, but it also works great for, for input as well. As far as the inputs and the parallel path goes, here you have a compressor and you know, if I want to do parallel compression there, you know, if I just went 50-50, now I've got an addition of 50% uncompressed and 50% compressed signal. This is going to play really, really big uh, in the immersive market where you're doing objects, right? Where you're going to do uh, direct outs from a channel uh, and that object is going to go directly to the, the spatializer. Well, now you have the ability to parallel process on a per channel basis uh, that can address the direct output. So it's a really, really handy feature, really forward looking feature for what we got going on. Same kind of thing for the gating, right? We could, you could do parallel gate where you could do a hard gate plus a non-gated signal and get some more impact on it if you wanted to do things like that. There's a lot of possibilities there. Robert, just yeah. a, a little history just for my own edification. Uh, so parallel compression really came out of like the recording industry, did it not? Yeah, parallel compression really found its legs in the 70s. Honestly, that's where it, it really started happening. Uh, and there was a particular style of compression called New York compression, which is a little different than what I'm just showing you here. This is just as basic as it gets. Uh, but the other parallel compressions involve going out an aux bus, out to equalization, out to compression, uh, and then returning and adding with it. It's the same principle. It's just a much more detailed version of it, you know, much more um, uh, nimble version of it where you can do a little, little more, have a little more depth on it. You can EQ the compressed signal with, uh, in the New York style. But there are, there are various kinds of uh, ways of doing it. I, I mean, in digital, certainly today, we have tons of ways of parallel compressing and, and taking care of those signals. So it's really great. And do you yeah, use that, that your question? Do you use it live? Do you use New York oh, yeah. compression? Yeah, all the time, all the time. I, I mean, I, fair to say, I anymore, I, I, it's just, I think the ear is expecting it and I use it everywhere. Now, do I use it the same for every style of music? Of course not. You know, I mean, if I'm doing 
you know, big rock, then yeah, there's a lot of parallel compression going on there. High ratios of compression as well, meaning it, it might be, you know, at least 50, maybe 60, 70% of the compressed signal versus the uncompressed. Flip that around and go to something like, uh, you know, I, I'll just use something outside the box. You know, something like jazz. Do I still parallel compress there? I do actually. I, I'll, I'll still come parallel compress there, but the ratio is way, way different. The, the vast majority of the signal is uncompressed, but I might add in 10%, 20%, maybe even 30%, maybe in the rhythm section or something to get it to pop and sit a little better for the audience. So yeah, parallel compression, I've been using it, I mean forever. since I've been using it since the early 80s for sure, and uh, I've been using it in live sound forever. So yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Yep, yep, thank you. I keep rolling over my cable. <laughs> All right, so we also uh, added in Venue 7 post-fader insert points. This is, and this is a really cool feature to add. I, it, it's long overdue, I, honestly, in my opinion. But now we have the ability to do a lot of Dugan work, uh, units in their hardware devices, et cetera. Uh, we also have the ability to do post-fade uh, compressions and things like that very easily here. Uh, this is kind of a nice one if you're, you know, if you want to kind of mix into a compressor now, uh, you know, putting this in post fade on an input and stuff is really, really good. It works great, especially if you have VC assignment to those inputs and you want to push them into compression and put that compression in the post fade section and off you go. So uh, we have a total now of four pre fade inserts and four post fade inserts per processing channel, meaning all inputs, all outputs have this capability on them. So you can see, you know, yeah, we have a lot of processing capability, but we also have a lot of places to use it if you want to do it, right? Yeah, you, you'll actually be able to see, this might get a little hard to see across the web, but there's actually two columns on the input strips now. What you're looking at is uh, the touchscreen view, and at the bottom where you can see it's circled in purple, there's actually two columns of plugins there that you can see. The blue ones are active, the gray ones are inactive. Uh, so you get full view of what plugins you have on every channel. Here's a good one. We have uh, delay compensation, automatic delay compensation now uh, for S6L. And this is a big deal. Uh, at least it is to me. <laughs> I'll say that. I've been, I've been kind of on the campaign and on the crusade about this for years now. Uh, five, six years, you know, teaching people how to do manual delay compensation uh, because, you know, because of these input inserts uh, where we're using third-party plugins and having to bus out to them, et cetera. You know, it's, it's, it, it's a challenge to deal with it. Well, we've kind of solved that challenge now in a really good way uh, with Venue now. We have the processing power to do this, and there's a complete automatic delay compensation uh, engine in uh, within the engine now. So what this allows you to do is if you, uh, if you have this on, and if you are taking all your inputs and assigning them essentially to the left-right bus, you're only using the left-right bus, maybe using VCAs to do your offsets, et cetera. Uh, but if you're only using the left-right bus and you have every input assigned, it will work exactly like an analog console, exactly like an analog console, meaning I can also take those inputs and bust them out, return them to channels, and those channels will be coherent. I don't have to do any additional delay, anything like that, which is heaven for doing things like adding distortions, you know, uh, doing parallel processing. For sure, you can do parallel processing now without any worry about what is going on in terms of, uh, you know, time offsets, et cetera. If you're gonna go through group paths, and uh, which I'm gonna cover here in a second, we go group to group, there is some additional little manual delay compensations that need to take place if you're gonna parallel compress at the group level, right? So. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, uh, just stay, uh, stay in touch with me or you know, keep an eye on my site over time. I'm gonna be doing some labs coming up on doing exactly that kind of work. But if you're, if you're not parallel compressing, we have a complete group to group structure that is also completely compensated all the way through the master bus. So this is a really, really big deal. It, I, I've used it a bunch now on shows, uh, especially when I've had to work quick uh, just to be able to go out and assign to the left, right bus and add plugins and do parallel processing without any worry of creating comb filtering and, and, and offset. It's really a, a tremendous luxury to have this at your disposal. Let's see here. Yeah, so we also have the ability, we've added to this the ability 
if you don't want to do ADC where you want where you think okay well I really don't want to have any additional big buffers here in the console well you can also use the input delay on channels to create your own sets of manual delay compensation so on the drawing there you can kind of or on the PowerPoint you can kind of see we've got a number of channels selected there and you can go right click any one of those channels and say align these channels right align total input I believe is what it says uh, I can't read it from where I'm at but that will actually take the channel delay and look at the longest path and then delay all of the other channels back to that path so it's great for realigning your drums maybe uh, if you have inserts that are causing offsets there uh, things like that so it's a it's a really nice easy way to do that great for monitor guys for sure uh, here's the bus to bus routing that I kind of hinted to earlier. We have uh, in venue seven, we release bus to bus, meaning group to group to group to group or group to aux, aux to group. You know, any combination of these uh, can be done now. So, you know, th that allows for a lot of re really unique and great processing. Uh, you can do, I think I got it in here. Yeah, here's an example that you might see. You could do all the way out to. Uh, three tiers, three complete tiers of groups before you hit your master bus here. So as you can see here, I got two inputs up in the top here that are kind of working as uh, working to their own group. Maybe that's a kick in and a kick out working to its own group that has its processing on it. So there's a kick group. Uh, and then those groups go on uh, to other submasters. You can kind of see there, I might have a submaster that is all drums. It would pick up those drum groups as well as the individual drum inputs. And then, then even go out to, you, you could very easily create uh, what is commonly referred to now as a P bus, uh, where is, where is a, another master bus before your grandmaster left right. So you could have master drums, or, or I should say master instruments, where you get it, maybe that top group is an instrument master, and you could have a parallel bus of that, a true parallel bus of that, and then have a vocal master as well. So you could have, you're just kind of breaking down into even more subgroups before it hits your grandmaster there. So. Uh, all kinds of possibilities like that now. Really, really great. Nice to be able to send groups up to an aux for sure. If you want to send groups maybe out an aux to get them to a, a subwoofer drive, things like that. Uh, really, really handy to do. So, and, you know, we keep it very coherent uh, going through here. So it's a, it's a nice way of doing it. We also have this thing called big meters now. I don't know if you guys have seen this, uh, but this is a really nice feature that allows you to on a per channel basis or you know any number of channels switch over to big meters where you get this big high resolution meter on the strip so what you're looking at there on the PowerPoint is the left hand version is the normal view and then if you literally just take your finger and swipe it down you'll see the big meter view Maybe I can show that for you here let me see if I can let's uh, let's do this let me turn on the camera let's see if we can get this going Okay, let's see if you can, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this actually. Well, I'll do it on a couple here just so you can kind of see it happening. Uh, let me get it. Okay, so this is an overhead look on the console. You can see I have some meter activity up here. If I just pull these meters down, they go to big meter view. And you can see all kinds of stuff going on there. It's just a high resolution look at the, at the meters. You can also do uh, keystroke commands that allow you to do all the meters. Uh, you can use this in conjunction with events, uh, which is really, really great. Um, uh, where you can, uh, like, I'll, I'll try to show you this if I got it set up. I don't know if I have it in this show file or not. Where If I solo a channel, it automatically takes it to big meters so I can look at it in high res. Things like that. You can do that with the events, et cetera. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. What have we got next? Oh, this is really cool. I, I was thrilled to see this. This kind of got in at the last minute on the software release, but now we now have the heat algorithm uh, available on all input channels on S6L. 
Uh, if you guys are familiar with Dave Hill and Crane Song, uh, he created a, an algorithm called Heat, uh, which is an analog emulation, right? Uh, he's used it in all of his processors. It's, it's been around for years and years and years. We've had it in Pro Tools uh, since I can remember. I mean, way back into the HDX, early HDX. And we now have it available on Venue itself. So what this allows you to do is either put uh, tape emulation or tube emulation on every input, right? If you want, it's available to every input. And you can have different colors of it, right? So different brightnesses, different intensities of it. Uh, so it's available on every channel. And, uh, you know, this is similar to a process that uh, some of the other console manufacturers do, but theirs is done at the analog level, right? M meaning once you put it on, it's on. Uh, in our situation, it actually comes in above playback. So you can actually use virtual sound check and address the heat algorithm and be able to adjust heat on your playback. You can actually do some rehearsing with it, et cetera. And this plays really, really well into, again, our events pro programming where we could... You could actually design up maybe your vocal fader, right? Where you could say, okay, if I could get my vocal fader up past minus three, it actually is going to drive the heat a little harder as well and take some of that transient information off of it. If we're doing tape compression, obviously it's going to smooth it. If we're going to uh, tube emulation, it's going to brighten it a little bit, right? So you can build that uh, integration into a fader move, into heat, all kinds of really, really cool stuff like this. And the beauty of it is we allow you to do that in virtual sound check uh, so you can uh, work on these things kind of off, off camera, so to speak, so, okay. All right, let's see. Yeah, here's uh, just a close-up look at it. You can kind of see here uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, the drive and the tonality choice there. So that's obviously a lot of tube saturation on it uh, and, you know, the, probably the brightest of the settings there. We also have the ability to do USB two-track playback and record. Uh, this is a really powerful feature to have at your hands. Uh, I, I'm telling you guys, I, I, I recently did a, uh, an opera recording uh, where, you know, I, if you've done any orchestra recording, you, you, you'll identify with this, where, you know, they, out of 3,500 bars of music, you know, they may record 10, 12, 20, 30 at a time, right? And I, in this session, I was sitting with the, uh, the composers and uh, Obviously, the conductor was out on stage conducting, but they wanted rough mixes of each one of these segments that we were doing. So it might be an eight-bar segment, a 20-bar segment, et cetera. And this absolutely saved the day because it allowed me to just recall a snapshot that had the bar numbers in it. As soon as I recalled that snapshot, it started a new two-track recording on the USB key. At the end of the night, I literally unplugged the USB key, hand it to the director, and they go back and drop it in iTunes and go to work. So... Uh, reviewing it. It was just sensational. A even they mentioned it. They were like, wow, we've never seen anybody be able to do anything like this. I mean, they were, they thought they were going to have to wait a day for roses, so, or ha for me to segment them all up. So it's really, really great workflow. Uh, again, in terms of record playback, we can tie that all to events. We can have, you know, fader moves, start a playback. We can have switches, start a playback. Whatever you want to do with it is probably possible. Uh, and all of this just goes straight to USB key. We can play back from USB key, uh, obviously, as well. All right, we also have, uh, and this one's kind of gone, I swear this has gone unnoticed to the industry. There's so many people that don't know we can actually do this on SXL. We have this thing called dual operator mode. And really, this was targeted toward the 48D when we released it because we felt like it was a big enough surface, uh, surface to support it. But you can also do this on 32D and uh, 24D as well because, you know, the, the kind of the thing to understand with dual operator is it doesn't necessarily take two people. It can take two people, but you can do two workflows on one console, right? So in this situation, you know, might you set up this as zone one. Uh, you might set up the other side as zone two. They have independent banking, independent control, uh, you know, have their own ability to navigate without interrupting each other. Uh, they have... Uh, you know, like I say, zone-specific banking navigation, uh, even specific, uh, yeah, this is a kind of a close-up look at it here, what it would look like. That's in normal, and then in dual operator, you would switch it over here, and now you've got all of the banking uh, choices and capability of uh, each user, even if it means, okay, I'm operating this operating front of house on the left side of the console, I'm operating monitors on the right side of the console or whatever it would be. You know, you pick your two workflows that you want to do.
can can I uh, ask a quick question? You sure can. Yes. Um, I wanted to. Could you go over um, like game guests and the new features around that? I think that people, in in a lot of cases, feel like that feature was kind of left behind in profile and didn't move its way forward. I don't know how to say that, but you get yeah. what I mean. Yeah, I get it. Uh, yeah, actually, if you just sit tight, Paul, I think I have that coming up here. If I don't, I'll definitely cover it. No question. All right, so uh, just finishing up on dual operator mode, you have uh, also user-defined solo uh, for each side of the console because there's two headphone buses. They're independently addressable, so you could have uh, assign one, any number of inputs to be assigned to one solo bus, the other, or both. You know, it can be done in both. So it's a really powerful thing, and it, we really did, a, I, I think, just an exceptional job of putting this together. Uh, it's easily done. It's easily done on the console. You can change modes without you know having to reboot the console things like that so it's it's really cool to be able to do this uh last one here we'll talk about ecx connection for remote control so we have an ecx port uh, on the control surfaces as we have always had uh, in venue and this allows for remote control of uh, the console so you could do that from a browser as you saw me doing it today uh, I was just using it, uh, using a program called Jump Desktop to take control of the console uh, and just operate it with a, a mouse and pointing device, or I mean a mouse and keyboard. Uh, this is also the way that we attach to the immersive DSP controllers, that all of our plugin information takes uh, control via that EC export through the DSP controllers. And we also have uh, remote control apps for iPad and iPhone. Uh, we have a monitor mix app that allows, I think we can have up to 16 iPads in play that are actually doing uh, fully bi-directional control of their mix on the console. And by, by bi-directional, I mean the, the engineer can see what you're doing on stage. You can see what the engineer is doing as well. So as the engineer makes changes, you see it right in front of you on your iPad and vice versa. And this, this keeps it where everybody is listening to the same thing. You know, it's not that situation where the monitoring engineer puts together a mix and sends it out there and then really has no idea what happens after that. Uh, if he solos the mix here, it's the same mix that the musician is hearing out there. So it's a, you know, you can be very collaborative in the work on it. And again, that's available on iPhone as well. Any, any iOS device will do it. We also have a function pad app uh, that allows you, uh, again, in, in conjunction with events, to be able to do all kinds of strings of activity on the console and just have it sitting off to the right over here. I have mine sitting up here uh, and allow you in big button mode to kind of touch and, and do all sorts of things. You can, ha you can have it start and stop Pro Tools. You can have it change your meter view. You can ha you really just about any action you can come up with, you can in in uh, instigate it on the iPad. So it's a really, really handy thing to have at your disposal. I, I encourage anybody that's using the console, man, get an iPad and a little router and just put this thing in play because it works so dang good. It's so helpful. All right, uh, I'm going to stop right there and address Paul's question on this uh, with regard to game guests. So let me go back to, let me get another camera in play here and see if I can do this. See if I can show this. One second here. Everything is in a play nice. Yes, there we go. So I'm just going to throw a couple of inputs down here so you can see them. All right, so let's get that up.
So I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit just so we can kind of see it. All right, uh, so if I've got everything going right here, uh, you should be able to see uh, four drum channels. Uh, this is going to be a kick in, out, uh, et cetera. And what Paul was alluding to was this uh, oops, thing we got called Game Guess, uh, which allows you to uh, kind of instantly set optimized gain for not only transport around the console, but also for Pro Tools recording as well. Uh, and in the, um, in the channel strip you see here, uh, and it's, it's not like we draw a lot of attention to it. Where am I, can you guys see my cursor there? Yeah, you can. Okay, so there's a question mark right there. And that's the game guess, all right? There's two ways of initiating it. You can initiate it on the surface or you can initiate it in the software. So I'm going to take and turn this gain all the way down on this first channel here. So as you can see, you know, that would not be near enough gain on that particular channel. But if I go ahead and gain guess it now, I'm going to click on question mark, and let it do its thing. And you're going to see it's going to add the proper amount of gain to it, right? Get my camera back here. So you can see it's added gain to it. Now, the thing to take note of, actually, you can see that on software as well. So I'll just leave it there. Look at where the fader ended up, right? So it, it turned it down so that it would be invisible to the audience uh, and so that the change would be invisible to the audience, right? And now I can kind of work my way back up to it. So when, by, that, by using that gain guess, we changed not only the input gain, but we changed the record level. Remember, those two things go hand in hand. Now, one of the things we changed in uh, Venue 7 <coughs> was the ability to have this address auxiliaries as well. Because obviously when we do this gain guess and it pulls this fader way down, well, that's all fine and dandy for anything that is post fader, right? But if you were mixing front of house and monitors on the same console and you did that gain guess and you had pre-fade sends that are going to the artist, now their, their level has just gone through the roof, right? Because it, it, those are pre-fade, it wouldn't have seen this post fade move. But we've actually addressed that now in venue seven. So if you gain guess, it's also gonna address auxes as well as uh, the post fade level. Okay, so it's it's a really handy thing. I this is no exaggeration. I probably use gain guess to set 99.9% .9 of the gains that I do on a given show. Uh, it's not to say that it's locked into place. Once you do it, you can still go in and adjust it if you misadjust it. You know, the, the main thing to understand with gain guess is that when you do it, the signal has to be present, like the drum or whatever you're going to gain guess has to be present and then sample it and let it do its work. If it's just an open microphone, it's going to open up that background noise as far as it can to get it up to line level. All right, so be aware. You know, you only want to do a channel at a time. I would strongly encourage you not to just press down and do multiple channels. So how do we do it on the actual channel itself? Well, let me go back to the uh, console or the screen that's got the camera. Here we go. So if you look here, this is my gain knob uh, for this particular channel, and I've got it turned all the way down. So if we want to gain guess the channel as it's running right now, we just literally press down and hold it until it flashes, and then let it go, and you can see it's done the gain guess, right? So it's put our channel where it needs to be, and then we get it back up in terms of gain. So yeah, I, I agree with Paul. This is something that kind of got glossed over. I, I think people assumed it didn't come across in S6L, but it did. And now it's an even better version of it, even a uh, more usable version of it. But as I said, I, I've been using it since day one and use it close to 100% of the time when I'm setting gains. It's just, it's just one of those things that's kind of no brain, requires no brain to do it. So it's great. All right, uh, Paul, any other, anything else you want me to cover on gain guess there? No, no, you know, it's just that that seems to get lost and, and, you know, being an old monitor engineer, getting your gains fast is, is uh, you know, important. Yeah, um, I agree with sorry, you. Sorry, I didn't mean to you. sidetrack you. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, you bring up a great point there, you know, given this implementation of it, now gain guess actually absolutely applies for monitor engineers, right, because it'll, it'll adjust post-fade levels, right, as you add gain it will turn an already established gain down and vice versa. You know, if it, uh, if gain guess uh, decreases gain, it'll turn it up in the aux to keep that, keep the gain, the gain setting invisible to the listener, right? 
Uh, we care about it because we care about record levels. We care about A to D conversion, et cetera. But man, we don't want to be just kind of ramping gains up and down while, while it's in somebody's ears. We can do that with gain guess very effectively, right? All right, uh, let's see. Now we're doing pretty good here. We're coming up on 10 to the hour. And, you know, let's take a, let's just take a quick look at events programming. I, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to show in this amount of time here, uh, but I definitely want to bring this to your attention because it, it's just one of those things. Again, I think it gets, it gets kind of glossed over by people. They don't really realize what is possible with this uh, ability on the console. So if you go to the control tab on our console, you'll see uh, a place called events, right? And events, very simply, are this. It is you're going to do something on the console and make something else happen. And you get to dictate how that happens. So uh, let me just do a new one here just to kind of show it. So if we were going to create a new event, and we would say, okay, well, what do I want to engage this event? Uh, maybe it's, a, uh, maybe it's a, a fader move. Maybe it's a switch. Uh, even a meter, maybe a level, a meter goes to a certain level and that's going to make something happen on the console. I know Sean Sullivan is doing, a, Sully, if you guys know him, is doing a lot of work with this particular one where he's having meter levels dictate whether, you know, gates are in play or, you know, you, you check in with Sully, he'll have a, have a bunch of them to show you, but uh, all kinds of things like that. So uh, if I solo a channel, that will make something else happen. Uh, I can have foot switches, GPI inputs, that cause something to happen on the console. And those things that can happen uh, are all, all kinds of things. I can even recall a snapshot and have that make something else happen on the console. Uh, let's see, what else? All kinds of things. VCA assignment can encourage a, an, an event on the console. Uh, spills, man, I mean, we've got just about everything covered in here now where that can be the activator, that can be the trigger. And then once Do you- Do you have that, any favorites, Robert? What's that? Do you have any favorite events? Favorite events. Yeah, I'll give you a good one here. A, a, a couple of good ones. I think I got them in this. If, if not, I'll, I'll try to build them quickly here. So in terms of actions, uh, again, almost any kind of action can happen as a result of that movement, right? So uh, again, you could have it recall snapshots and you can create, I mean, if you, you can get crazy with it and create very long strings of activity if you want to do it. Let's say maybe I recall a snapshot that recalls another snapshot. And in that snapshot, there's a recall that's going to take place that's going to engage another event. You know, you can create big, big strings of activity here. So uh, just give you some examples. I mean, these are really simple examples. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to, let's get back on the old head here. Uh, might be a little tough to see, but uh, yeah, it's not the best. <laughs> I obviously need to work on my camera lighting in here. So as what you can see right now is I have a number of strips safed here. These are bank safed, meaning no matter where I go bank wise, these eight faders stay there, right? But what if I would wanted to get to something that was underneath this? Like if I go to another bank and I got this safed, I need to nudge to see the things that are underneath this set of eight. Well, instead of nudging, maybe what I do is I have this up and I just bypass these six for a second. Well, I have a, 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 an event that does that. If I press F3, function switch three, it bypasses these safes temporarily. So if you see, if I pass, click on three, it starts flashing, the safes are bypassed and I can see the inputs that are underneath uh, the safe channels. Once I'm done, once I've made my move, whatever, I come out of safe bypass and my safes are back in place, right? So uh, really, really handy to have that kind of functionality at your disposal. Uh, let's see, song layout by master. I'm just looking up, up and down the list here to see what we got in this show file. Yeah, you can build, as you can see here, actually once I put it up here, you can do all kinds of bypassing. Uh, it's really handy to do that. 
Another one that I've seen people do, uh, although I don't have it built into this file, is you can use time of day to activate an event. So uh, we're all front of house guys at, at some point, right? So how about this? You know, how, everybody used to the production manager coming to you at 6.30 at night and go, doors are opening, please put on some music, right? And if you're not around, they always get angry at you because they need to put on the music because the people are walking in. Well, you can say, okay, on my clock, on the console, here is time of day down here. I'm going to say at 6.30, take fader 27, turn it up. And when, I, when that fader hits minus 3, it turns on the CD player or turns on, maybe I'm playing back from USB key, but it starts the walk-in music, right? And then I, I've even I've helped somebody just do this the other day, funny enough. They wanted to have volume increases on that music that they didn't want to have to tend to every 10 minutes a half hour before the show started. So they wanted it to climb up 3 dB every 10 minutes. So we just programmed that in, into the clock. At you know, 640, it moves up 3 dB. At 650, it moves up another 3 dB. All of that is just programming in these events, and they're really, really easy to do. So let's take a look at a couple of them here. Let's just examine a couple. I think one of the, one of the really early events that I did, uh, even back in the days of uh, you know, uh, profile and stuff, was being able to quickly change between a, a primary mic and a spare mic uh, for a vocal, which you know, just basically recalled a patch change and took the, the microphone that he's singing on and patch it into the channel that I'm working on. That way you didn't have to duplicate channels, anything like that, right? Uh, let's see, so here's, yeah, so for instance, here's one, uh, function switch 24 is pressed, recall the snapshot, uh, Patty LaBelle performs uh, over the rainbow, and it takes Pro Tools to that position and puts it in play. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? These are all uh, bypasses, so I, I've got it where I can just A, B, in and out of uh, tape emulation, so, or preamp emulation, so I can hear how extreme I'm doing it on the mix. These are all kinds of bypasses. Yeah, I don't have a ton built into this particular session, but uh, I would really encourage you to get in there and play around with this. You can do some absolutely fantastic things. I, I, I don't say, honestly, anymore, I just think there's probably nothing I can't do uh, <laughs> with, a, with a fader or a switch on this console to in, in, uh, implement another change, you know. Uh, it's really, really good. I think one of the favorite ones I have recently, like I said earlier, is I've got it set up where when I solo a channel, it actually takes its channel to uh, big meters, right? So uh, it's, it, it's almost, it's kind of harkens back to the gamble days where if you soloed an input, you were looking at it pre-fade. If you came out of solo, you were looking at it post-fade. You could actually do that sort of thing on this console as well by changing meter status uh, when you do that. So uh, I've, I've done it where you, I was trying to emulate that gamble workflow, right? So uh, it's, it's really fun to do. Well, let's see. What else we got? I think that's going to be about it. I think we're coming up on the hour here. Let me, uh, I think I got one more slide here, and I want to make sure you guys all know this. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this is the live support number. If you guys run into any kind of issues or et cetera, we have a fantastic support program uh, for the console. Very responsive guys. They will get you sorted out very quickly. Uh, we also have, oh, I didn't put this in here. Uh, Paul, do you know the address for venue demos? If you want to get a demonstration of venue either, and we can kind of do this really cool. Champ Peck and I do the demos here in the US. And we've recently kind of rebuilt our rooms where we can do this. Uh, if you have a console on site, we can take remote control of your console and walk you through how to do things. Uh, and we can also show our console to you on site, you know, just in one of these Zoom rooms, kind of like what we're doing here, only the, with the additional functionality of I can have control of your console if I need to do it, like if you get stuck on something or I need to walk you through something. Uh, I think it, it's, is it, what is it, what is the address, Paul? Do you know it? It's Venue Demo, I think, at something or another. I do not know. I didn't even know we had one of those. That is new to me. Oh, my goodness. Yes. No, this is true. Okay, now I'm going to have to dig it up. So you guys are going to have to bear with me one second. I, I, I just call you and bug you when I need that. <laughs> this is true. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me see how I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for now. 
I stand by. I'm going to ask you to indulge me here just a little bit while I dig up this this address. There we go. So if you just uh, send an email to this address, either Chant or I will uh, arrange for a demo for you. We're, like as I said, we uh, all right. Maybe I didn't mention it. I don't remember. But, uh, but we we both had our our rooms broken down for about two months here, uh, and this is actually the first presentation I've done in the new room. So. Uh, we're still kind of working some of the a few of the bugs out, but it's coming together really good. But I think we could still do this uh, pretty handily if you need it done. So if this is something that interests you, uh, you want to do it back through your guys at TMP or whatever, you know that's fine too. Uh, but we can answer a lot of questions this way and really get you up to speed on the console very very quickly. So if you need this, please use it as a resource. All right, and on that note, I think uh, that's going to be about it this morning. And unless you got questions, I encourage you, if you have questions, please let's get on here and address them now is the time to do it. No, nope, looks like everybody's good. I answered the questions in the, um, in the Q&A section, Robert. All right, All right. Well, great. Okay, well, awesome. I appreciate you doing this. Thank yeah, you so, this, so much. Uh, hope this met the expectations. And if it didn't, we'll do better next time. So uh, <laughs> thanks to the guys at TMP for uh, inviting us in to do this. We very much appreciate the opportunity to do this with your customers. So uh, we're, welcome, we're, we're willing to do this anytime you guys want to do it. So let us know, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. We appreciate it, sir. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you so much, Robert. Yes, and Paul, thank, thank everybody you. for for jumping on to this and I and, uh, uh, hope everybody learned everything that they wanted to learn. If they have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'm Paul Marini or Robert gave you a contact point to get to him uh, or your TMP salespeople. And remember there is some financing, special financing available through TMP through the end of the month. So, you know, if you're looking to get a desk and get ahead of your ROI and, you know, get some rental income before you have to pay for the whole thing, it's a great way to do it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much to everybody at TMP. And again, Robert, bless you. Thank you, man. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Welcome Thank back you, everyone. to work. Let's go. See you, Robert. Thank you, sir. See you. Bye-bye.